Let's see your Bibles. One more time. So, hey, wait, 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 wait. Take a deep breath in. Let's do the long, long one. Take a deep breath in. Here we go. Wow. Very good. Let's see your Bible. I mean, your pen. <laughs> Lesson plan. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> Second chapter from the beginning. <laughs> Lord, we pray everyone can find their Bible. Second chapter. We pray you speak to us and we pray we'd listen and we would find a relationship with you today, that we would establish a relationship with you today, that you would teach us more about what that means. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. 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 I, I talk to many people about Jesus all the time and I get many interesting conversations with people. And one of the most common responses is, I'm not into formal religion, I'm a spiritual person. So I have a spiritual relationship with God, and he knows my heart. Matter of fact, there's a new book, uh, New Earth, that Oprah is pushing. How many of y'all heard of the book, Eckhart Tolle? Some of you may be reading that book, and maybe I'll do a series on that later, but I want to talk about the concept of being spiritual, because one of the things I've heard her say, and them say, this is not a religion, it's a spiritual experience. You have your religion, your Christianity, your Judaism, whatever, this is different. And so I want to talk about that because it's very, that's a very scary proposition when you separate your Christianity from your spirituality. Because Christianity is your spirituality. If it's become your religion, it's probably not Christianity. It's probably your own form of it in your mind. So I want to talk about being spiritual because if you call on a spirit or you say you want to have a spiritual experience, you may not get what you want. First, we got to talk about what is a person. Because when we talk about what is a spirit, we got to talk about what a person is. Look to the person next to you and ask them this question. Are you a person? <laughs> I am a person. Now look to the person next to you and say, are you sure? <laughs> Seemed like a very simple question. Just keep talking forever. <laughs> Are you sure? So what's your name? How are you doing at the church? <laughs> <laughs> Call me. <laughs> well, what is a person? Now, we think of a person, we think of an individual, we think of someone with arms, legs, nose, can speak. But you don't need any of that to be a person. What makes you a person is the unseen. It's your ability to love. It's your ability to have a relationship. It's your ability to communicate, to encourage, to understand someone. Your ability to have a relationship with God and reflect the heart and mind of God to someone else. Because everything we know about being a person, we receive from God. He made us in his image and he made us a person like him. He is a person in the sense that he has the ability to love, to encourage, to communicate, to rule or have dominion, to create and be creative. All those qualities that make you a person, your arms and legs do not make you a person. They are how you express yourself. But you can express your personhood without those things. One of the most amazing people, I, I never met him, but the most, most amazing people I know of is Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder is what we call blind, but there's no way Stevie Wonder does not see. He sees stuff we never see. And so, you know, the, the outward, the, the, the physical is not what makes you a person. So it's the inward. It's the invisible. And it's your ability to have relationship. There are people who are not necessarily persons. In other words, they have lost the ability to have relationship. And they are almost an animal. Almost. I was in, a, in prison. I, I was visiting a prison. <laughs> in uh, Mexico, Tijuana, they, they have a prison called La Mesa Prison. Now, in, in Mexico, the prison are run differently than the United States. In the United States, you have your cell. You may have one cell. You may have be in a, in a cell by yourself. It's very um, controlled. You don't have family members in the prison with you, obviously. We say obviously. 
The guards don't walk around with guns in their hands in where the general population is, and they have them in very secure areas in the towers, etc. When you go to Mexico, very different. Your family can live with you. So when you go into prison, in La Mesa prison specifically, and I've been to several in Tijuana, in Mexico, but La Mesa was the biggest one I've been to, they have a yard that's maybe a couple football fields in size, and when you walk into the yard, you see all these little kids riding their bikes, playground, grandmas, wives, husbands, all living with the inmates. And if you have money, you can get yourself, buy yourself out of a cell <clears throat> and build your own little uh, uh, room. It's, it's not what we would think of an apartment, but they call it an apartment. Plywood, a, a bed, a little curtain, have your own little thing. They have taco stands in this prison. <laughs> no lie. Has anyone been to La Mesa prison? Can validate. You know what I'm talking about. You go in there, there's a whole bunch of taco stands, and they're just set up just like you would see on the street. They got little sodas and chiclets and all the stuff they got. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's just like on the outside. And so you go in there, and they have their businesses, and they do business, and with that money, they can buy their, they can move up and get an apartment in the prison, and your whole, your wife, your, your parents, your little kids can come live in there with you and do your time literally with you, very opposite of the United States. So I go in there, and I'm walking around, and, and you, we went in some apartments to see the nice places. We went in the back to see the, 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 the real nasty concrete floor, metal bars, open sewer, nasty. And there was a guy... Never forget it. He was in a cage. The reason I say he was in a cage, they were metal bars, but he was outside on the second floor. He was up, raised up. And it was just happened to be in this, between buildings or whatever, and he was outside, and so when he looked outside of his bars, it was outside. He wasn't in the building. And he was in this cage, running back and forth, screaming at people. Ah, ah. And, and I, I stood there, and I'm like, okay, I got to witness to that guy. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we're going to do our thing, but we got to get to that guy. And I just stood there and I said, I can't communicate with him. He was like an animal. And he, he couldn't communicate. He couldn't have a relationship. He was out of control. Was he a person? He was a human. But his ability to relate, his ability to have a relationship and express and receive love and express and receive information was limited. And so his image of God and his ability to have relationship, his, his personhood was diminished. It was being destroyed. It had been destroyed by whatever he was into. Maybe he was being possessed. Maybe it was drugs. I don't know. So when you say, am I a person? A person is a living thing that can communicate to someone in the, according to the image of God. A dog can't reflect the God's image like you and I can. Okay? So that's a person. When we think of a spirit, I want you to think of a person that is most of the time invisible. A spirit is a person most of the time, that, or well, all the time, is eternal, as you and I are eternal. And a spirit is a person that is uh, most of the time invisible, non-physical. And he is smarter than you, more powerful than you, more wise than you, more in tune with God than you. Even the demons are more in tune with God with you. They know about him better than you. So when you say you want to have a spiritual relation, experience, what you're saying, whether you realize it or not, is I want to have a relationship with one of these spirits. One of these people that's eternal and non-physical. Because what they're going to do is they're going to speak to me. They're going to influence my mind. They're going to give me advice. They're going to guide and direct me. They're going to show me things from their perspective. That's a spiritual experience. Now, in the Bible, when the Bible talks about sorcery, you get the word, the Greek word pharmakia, where we get the word pharmaceutical, drugs. When you see sorcery, understand they're talking about through drug use, calling on demons. When you get high, coke. Meth, marijuana, how, as the more serious the drugs, the more you open yourself up, especially if you get hallucinant drugs, LSD, it's heroin, you are saying, demons, come on. That's what you're saying. You may not realize it. You open your soul up to demons, come on. And you want, because you know what you want? You want another experience. You want to take your life somewhere else. Why? <laughs> because you are not satisfied. You have been separated from your creator. And you are, you, there's, a, there's an emptiness in your heart you're trying to get somewhere else. We're going to talk a minute that one of these bad spirits told you you can get it that way. And he's lying. You're going to see that in a minute. So when you say spiritual, everyone say spiritual. I want you to understand, I want you to think about you're having a, a relationship with one of these invisible, eternal, non-physical people, persons, power. But he has more power than you, these people. They have more influence than you. They have more wisdom. They can travel where you can't travel. But they are a person in the sense that they can communicate to you. And when you think you're just going to go, oh, I feel it, I feel it, that that's not what they're doing. 
They are manipulating you, stroking you, very strategically stroking you to bring you somewhere. So whenever you hear someone say, listen, if you could, if you could have your Bible, but we have, you can be spiritual over here, be careful. Because what they're doing is introducing you to a person. And you better know who that person is because he has a name. And there's many of them. Now, there's a good one, the Holy Spirit. And there's a whole bunch of bad ones. And we're going to see in a minute why they contradict and why you need to distinguish the two. Uh, some are evil, unclean, wicked. And then there's one good one, the Holy Spirit. And we'll tell you why, how you can distinguish the difference between the one and the two. Now, number one of your notes, we all crave spiritual fulfillment or spiritual life because we are made in the image of God. The reason we crave it is because we are made in the image of God and we have been separated from our creator. And we are craving to get back to our creator. We are craving to be fulfilled in the way we were created to be fulfilled. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> there are certain, if you plant a certain plant in the garden, in your garden or in your wherever, your house, and you go to Home Depot because you think you can do it, and you say, I got, a, I, got a, I got a rose plant. Tell me what I should feed it. And they're going to tell you, you need to feed it this because that rose plant is craving that. Well, I have a, a azalea. Is that a, a plant, azalea? Okay, I got an azalea. Is it a flower? Huh? Okay, it's a, it's a rose? Azalea is a rose? Okay, you are azalea. You know what this is. Whatever we think it is, it, just, it doesn't matter. It's just alive. And you go, I got an azalea, and it's not looking good. They go, oh, you need to give the azalea this. I got a palm tree. What do I, oh, you got to give it this. Why? Because they all crave something different. Your soul craves something very specific. Why? Because your creator gave it that craving. So you don't want to give your soul something it's not craving because it will kill it. So look what it says in verse, chapter 2, verse 7. God created the heavens and the earth. He created the fish, the birds, the bees, the animals, the land, the light, the darkness. And in verse 7 it says, chapter 2, verse 7, then the Lord, everyone say Lord. Lord. Then the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground. Fellas, if anyone ever calls you a dirt bag, say, I got it. <laughs> Can I get an amen from the fellas? <laughs> ain't no big thing. Ain't no big thing. I'm a dirt bag. <laughs> Ladies say hey. hey. <laughs> That's right. So, so yeah, okay, okay. We're dirtbags. You know, whenever, whenever I speak at the all-guys event, you, one of the first things you always want to tell guys is that they're big, ugly lugs. You guys are a bunch of ugly lugs. They go, ah! <laughs> Don't say that at a women's event. <laughs> They'll jack you up. <laughs> all the ladies are beautiful. That's right. That's me. That's me. <laughs> show enough. Show enough. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Say dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils a person. He made a human, but then he breathed into him a person. Life. He didn't breathe into him an animal. He breathed into him a person. Someone that God can have a relationship with. And someone that can have a relationship with other persons, specific. And to have a relationship this way, he breathed into him ruha, spirit, his breath, this invisible person. You have that invisible person in you. Your body is the package. If you cut off my arm, I'm still the same person. I may be mad, but I'm still the same person. <laughs> but that person has not changed. And by the way, if I die... That person will go somewhere and live forever. You too have an eternal, invisible person in you. When you say you want to experience, you are saying, I want my invisible person to have an experience with some other invisible person that's, that's bigger than me. That's the spirit you're looking for. That's bigger than me. I want, you want to have this experience. I want to feel something. Don't go for a feeling. You want to walk by faith, not by sight. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians, if you're in the Old Testament, go all the way to the New Testament, the seventh book in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to tell you about the person that God breathed into Adam and Eve, that he will breathe into you, the Holy Spirit. Everyone say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Say Espiritu Santo. <laughs> yes, Espiritu Santo. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Holy Spirit. Say, Say, <laughs> That don't mean anything. <laughs> Sounded good, though. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Chapter 2, verse 1. 
chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 9. First Corinthians. Eye has not seen, say I. Ear has not heard, say ear. Nor have entered into the heart of man, say heart. And say mind. The things that God has prepared for those who love him. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. That your eyes have never seen. Your ears have never heard. Your mind has never conceived the things that God has for you. And the three, I want you to say your own first name. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. God, your eye, your ear, your mind has never comprehended what God has for that person. You. You. God is saying, I have something for you. And you don't know it. But look what it says. This is, this is, this is, this is the exciting part. Look what it says. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. Woo-hoo. Check it out. Now, if you've ever asked Christ to be your Savior, your spirit's in you. But I always, for this story, even though the spirit's everywhere, I, I put them here so I can look at them. And I go, Spirit, are you telling me that you know some things about me? You know things that God has for me. I don't want your blessing, and you shouldn't want mine. You should want yours. Because God got a good one for you. And by the way, he can... Hook me up and hook you up at the same time. There's a whole lot to go around. Say amen. Amen. There's a whole lot to go around. So we don't need to be jealous about each other. We can just get our own. Just get your own. Say, I want mine. Very good. So look what it says. Here's how you're going to get it. Verse 10, that God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. You want to know the deep things of God? You can read a book. Let God tell you. Imagine if you were at home. By yourself, lonely. You didn't know what your life was about. And God said, psst. And you went. <laughs> Have you ever felt like someone was talking to you? How many of y'all talk to yourself? <laughs> you know, it's a psychiatric disorder. <laughs> it's not. You know God is there. And you know there's more for you in this world. You, you, you know it. You know it. You, you say, there's got to be more to it. I know I'm supposed to do something better than what I'm doing. I know there's more for me, and I can feel it. I can sense it. And by the way, you also know that there are things that exist that you don't see. Gravity, air, the most powerful that we all crave every day is love. You've never seen it, but you feel it. You know it. It guides you. It directs you. It influences you every single day. Love. Guess what the Bible says? God is love. You didn't create love. Your hormones didn't create love. God created love. And so when you have this love experience with people, he's just, he's just showing you what he wants to have with you. Simple. It's like we think, oh, this is my love and this is, God said, no, 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 I created love so you can have a loving relationship with me and with people. That's part of being a person. And so you know there's more to your life. You know there's more meaning for your life. You know there's clear direction for you. There's a better vision for you. And you're just like, I, where do I go? Look what the Bible tells you, that God will reveal it, the deep things of God as it pertains to your life through the Spirit. Remember, this person. And by the way, what do you do with people? You talk to people. You listen to people. You communicate with people. You encourage people. You console in people. You lean on people. That's what he does. Holy Spirit will encourage you, convict you, guide you, illuminate truth to you. We're going to see in a minute. Pray on your behalf. It's going to fill you, be on you, <laughs> come out of you, flow like rivers of living water. It's a person. He's a person you can sin against. He's a person you can grieve. You can quench his power and frustrate him. He's a person that wants to give you talents and gifts and vision and power. He's a person that, that is your friend and you're wanting to go, the Bible says, whoring after another God. And you may never call to God. It's just something else that you lean on for your life's purpose. That's what the devil wants you to think. It's, oh, it's not religion. It's something else. Oh, it's religion. Because it's your soul searching for this other person. That's spiritual. It's God. It's a spiritual thing. It's a religion. Either way you look at it, 
You can't get around it. Why? Because he breathed into you an eternal person. He breathed into you a spiritual being that has to have a spiritual relationship. You can't get around it. And so, so here it is the spirit. Look at it says in verse 11, for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. How many of you, and let's be honest, and I'll be the first to raise my hand, you got secrets that nobody knows. <laughs> you have stuff going on in your heart and your mind. Nobody knows. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know what? God knows. He knows it all. At the same time, God has thoughts. God has passion. He has ideas. He has a desire for you, for you, for you, for you. You as an individual, he's like, man, I wish I, wish I could bless them. I wish I could love them. I wish they would let me talk to them. I wish I could show them all that I plan. And we're walking around like this. And he's like, and the Holy Spirit's going, Psst. And you're like, what? Psst. You're like, ah. Eh. God. Verse 12. We have not, now we have received not the spirit of the world. That's a different spirit. That's this guy. Bad. Spirit of the world. Uh-uh. We have experienced not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God, who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us. Do you know that God wants to make you fulfilled for free? Everyone say free. free. He wants to show you a purpose for free. You don't need to be in a rat race. He wants to bless you for free. What does that mean? Is that when you ask him to forgive you of your sin, he freely forgives you and establishes a relationship with you, through, with your soul? That your soul, which is the seat of your emotions, your soul, which is the seat of your personality and your character, your soul, this eternal part of you that has relationship with the Holy Spirit. Hmm. And this Holy Spirit lives in you and speaks to your soul, and your soul chooses to say, I'm going to obey you or I'm not. God wants to have relationship with you for free. And he wants to show you all the things God has for you for free. And we hold them up every day. Well, do this and I'll, I'll accept you. Do this and I'll obey. What? What? He wants to freely show us every day your life. You talking about being a supernatural life? You talking about your life being unexplainable? You walk with God and you trust that person, the third person of the Holy Spirit, the, Holy, the, whole, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. You trust him. You listen to him. Why? Because he's trustworthy. He's good to you. Do you know the only reason that all of you are not dead by depression through knowing your own sin? You ever offend somebody and you feel so bad you just feel like you are just horrible? Anybody? Very good. We all feel that. Can I, can, can I get an amen? I mean, you just feel like, how did I do that? I am a horrible person. Do you know why you don't feel that every single day? You ever wonder that? You're probably thinking, because I don't do that stuff bad every day. Yes, you do. <laughs> Imagine if everyone you thought something against knew what you thought. Let me say it this way. Imagine if all your thoughts came out as words. You would have to walk around going, Jesus, 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 Jesus. That's the only way you can get around it. Can I get an amen? You would meet people and go, because you know you'd be busted. Well, don't you know that God knows all those words and it breaks his heart? And you know the only reason it doesn't break your heart? Because he shields you graciously from how much you hurt him. And if you knew, it will crush you. That's because he's a good friend. You can't handle it. But he also shields you from knowing all that God would do for you because you couldn't handle that either. Your head would explode with excitement. You wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it. You mean me. If, I, if, I, if 24 years and three, four weeks ago, I got saved 24 years ago, uh, April 12th. 24 years and two weeks. So 24 years, two weeks, and two days ago, God would have said, you're going to be a pastor. Uh, hey. Go ahead, girlfriend. 
three snaps in a circle. <laughs> I would have went, bam, my head would have exploded. And what God has for you is like, turn to Romans chapter 8. The book right before where you're at. The book right before where you're at. Romans chapter 8. Everyone say Romans. Say person. Here's what the Spirit does. How many of you have ever had to pray? Just one book before you where you're at. How many of you ever had to pray and you prayed like this? And you have this, this, all this stuff you want to pray and all the stuff you want God to do and you don't know how to say it. You're like. And you start fidgeting. Look what the Spirit does. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself. Say Spirit himself. Spirit. Makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Remember that person I was telling you about? We're talking about the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the good Spirit. You know what he does? Because he knows the deep things of God as pertain to you and he knows your heart as well. Prays for you. Doesn't mean you can't pray. Doesn't mean you shouldn't pray. He's that kind of brother. That he prays on your behalf. You're praying for a new Corvette. And the Holy Spirit knows that if you got a new Corvette, you would never, ever go to church again. <laughs> you would never read your Bible. You would forsake God because you already gave your life to God, but you would forsake God. So what, what the Holy Spirit says is, is uh, Father, I think he really needs a bike. <laughs> but for real, you sometimes pray for stuff that God is saying, based on my plan for you, my design for you, what really would make you happy? Because I'm your friend, pray for this. And if every day you got on your knees and you said, Holy Spirit, guide my prayer. Guide my words. Don't let me waste time desiring stuff that's not good for me. Show me God's plan for my life. Should I work here? Should I take this major? Should I hang out with these people? Tell me. And the Holy Spirit will say, here's what you need to do. And guess what? He'll never lie to you. Why? Because he's a good friend. He's God. And he knows you. He knows the deep things of God that pertain to you. When you say you want a spiritual experience, this is the guy you need to mess with. This is the guy you need to hang with. This is the guy you need to talk to and listen to. Because on the other side, who? Look at number two in your notes. Spiritual death and God alienation occur when we sin. Genesis chapter 2. Back, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 2. Back in the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter 2. Second, book, second chapter of the Bible. Verse 15. Verse 15, it says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, we may eat, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you shall surely do what? Amen. Say surely what? Amen. Well, I don't believe the Bible's true. Well, guess what? It says right here that if you sin, you die. That's what it says. Do you know anybody that ain't going to die? Oh, no. You know anybody that's not a sinner? Oh, no. That's true. Why? Because when God breathed into Adam and they had a relationship, God told Adam, if you sin, our relationship is broken. What happened? They sinned, their relationship was broken, and then he eventually, their relationship died. He became spiritually dead, and then he eventually physically died. When you were born, you were born spiritually dead, incapable of this kind of relationship. You have this kind of relationship, but you can't have this kind of relationship until the Bible says you're born again. We'll see that in a minute. How many of y'all saw the, the Night of the Living Dead movie? The Night of the Living Dead. How many of you have never seen that movie? Okay. You've heard of it? How many of you have never heard of it? Okay. It, When I was a kid, I was 10 years old, the, we had the first version, then they had a new version come out. I saw the first version. I saw a little bit of the second version, but it was just, I, I wasn't into it, but I just wanted to see how to compare them. But the first one I've seen a lot of times when I was a little kid, black and white, before y'all were born. And in the Night of the Living Dead, something happened. I can't remember how these people became like this, but once you died, you came back to life. But you were like a zombie. You walked around like this. If you, if you got shot in the head, you still have a hole in your head, and you would bling. And then you go, with a hole in your head. 
with an axe in your head. You could just hit him in the head with a bat. Bam, and they would just go, bam. Uh, you can run him over with a car. Nothing can stop him. And so what happened is once they got to you, they would just start biting on you and trying to kill you. And then when you died, however you died, then you would walk around. Uh, and you look for other people who aren't like you, and you try to kill them so they could be like you. Are you following me? Good. My brother and I would watch these movies, then we would act them out. <laughs> we'd just go bite each other's head. Uh, and we'd walk around the house, and you're like, uh, uh, chase each other. With this hat, you couldn't go any faster than this. So, uh, 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 uh. And so, because we couldn't catch each other that way, we would fake it and kind of just walk around. And right when I get next to him, I go, ah. <laughs> we watched the, uh, the, 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 the Exorcist, the first one. Linda Blair, how many of y'all saw that? The most scariest movie ever made. Girlfriend was weird. <laughs> Guacamole, puke, it was nasty. Y'all remember the first one? What's the music? Nee. Nee. It, it's, it's. And the priest, I mean, you know, you, you see a priest from then on in, and it's like, brother, you, you know, don't even, why are you going in there? And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, we watched that movie, and the night we watched the movie, we slept, my brother and I slept in the same bed back to back. <laughs> because, you know, we wanted to make sure if someone was coming in the room, that he would look, and, and I got facing the wall, so I just had to look this much. That's all I had to guard. He had to guard the room. <laughs> so we're laying back to back, right? And, and I said, Mark, and he went what? And I went, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Try to spin my head around. He's now in a mental hospital, and uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh -uh. There are so many people who are walking around, they're intelligent, they got jobs, they got makeup, they got hair, <laughs> but they're dead. They're spiritually dead. They're literally like night of the living dead. They don't hear God. They don't see God. They don't communicate to God. It's all them. It's all this. Horizontal relationship with people. There's nothing here. No life. No spiritual life, and they're craving what God made them for, but they're trying to get it this way. It never works. So when someone tells you, we're going to have this spiritual experience, you have to understand, they're not talking, unless they say Holy Spirit, Jesus, they're talking about this spirit. This spirit, the Bible calls the spirit of wickedness. Unclean spirit, the spirit of the world. Bad news. This spirit will lie to you. Look at your notes. Number three, Satan deceives us. To to fulfill our spiritual longings is something other than God. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3. Ch Genesis. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say to you, you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God has said, you shall not eat of the fruit that's in the middle of the garden lest you, and touch it lest you die. Basically, she said, we can eat anything except that tree right there or we're going to die. And look what the devil said. And here is the devil's strategy. The serpent said, you will not die. For God knows in the day you eat. Your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That verse, those two verses, is the foundation of every other belief system that has anything to do with spiritual things. That's outside the Bible. That right there. Here's what I mean. Your creator, God, Jehovah God, your creator who formed you and breathed into you a person, in order so he can have a relationship with you and fulfill all the cravings he gave you in the first place. All the spiritual cravings he gave you in the first place. And here's what he said. He said, if you want to protect our relationship, if you want to protect your person, if you want to fulfill your person, if you want to secure eternity in heaven for your person, you do this. You have a relationship with me. If you don't want to fulfill that, you disobey me and we can separate ways. But the devil comes and says, God is lying to you. And he will tell you that any way he can get you to believe it. And what he's going to tell you is that, one, you don't need God. You can do this all by yourself. And number two, 
If you do it by yourself, you're not going to die. There's going to be no consequence. You're not going to lose your spirit. It's not going to have no consequ- eternal consequence. And you could be like God, deciding good and evil on your own. That is the foundation of all religions and all faiths, including this thing that Oprah's pushing about. You don't, you don't need to just have this experience because you could do it by yourself. Be careful. If you could do it by yourself, well, where did all this stuff come from? What God are we talking about? Does he have a name? If someone says they're having a spiritual experience, you need to ask them, what's the name of the spirit? Because we got the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. So tell me the name of your spirit. Tell me where you get the information about the spirit. Where did you get this? Where did, where, where did you, how do you know about the spirit? How do you know how he's going to treat you? Oh, just open your mind up. Just think and re- be careful. That's what the devil wants you to think. Because here's what the devil's going to say. Do it by yourself. And when you have a consequence, one in every four girls in high school has a sexually transmitted disease. You know why? Because they believe the lie. And you may say, well, that's okay, because my consequence, sin consequence, it has a cream. <laughs> say cream. It's okay that I have a little, little red, redness. I have a cream. So the devil, that's okay, devil. I'll take your medicine because I can just put on my cream. Or I can just put on a condom. Or I could just, you know, uh, put fake teeth in my head if I, if I lose my teeth from crystal meth. What the devil's going to tell you is that you got all these consequences, that there's going to be no consequence, and when a consequence happens, you know what you say? I can just cover it up. It's no big deal. So I got my heart broke. So I got addicted. So I was hung up. So I lost my job. It's okay. It doesn't matter. That's what he wants you to say. Why? Because that, the evil spirit, remember the bad person? He's going to lie to you and tell you that. You have no consequence. And you know what else he's going to tell you? You don't need some preacher telling you what to do. Do it yourself. That's exactly what he said. You don't need anybody telling you what to do. You don't need the Bible. You don't need God. Do it yourself. Just make sure you know who you're listening to. You make sure you know his name. You make sure you know his character. You make sure you know his track record. He told you you're not going to die. Are you going to die? Yes. He lied to you. And the story, he's the father of lies. He told them they're not going to die. Did they die? Yes. He told you. If you got high, you would never have a consequence. Did you have a consequence? Yes. He told you if you lied, you get away with it. Did you get away with it? No. He told you you cheated. You wouldn't have a consequence. Did you have a consequence? Yes. He lies to you every single day. And even when you got away with it in the eyes of someone else, you didn't get away with it in your heart and with God. He lies to you. And yet you keep going, I think I'm going to try again. Well, here's what's going to happen. One day you're going to die. That's a fact. And you're going to die because God is faithful. And you're going to stand before this person, the one who's been loving you and trying to encourage you. And what are you going to tell him? You can't say you didn't know because I'm yelling loud enough for you to know. (laughs) You can't say you didn't know. You can't say he didn't treat you good. You can't say he wasn't faithful to you. And so this person, the Holy Spirit, this invisible, eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing, loving God, and by the way, God is love, this all-powerful, knowing person of the Holy Spirit, of, of the Godhead, is trying to love you and to encourage you and to have relationship with you. Why? So he can fulfill that craving that he gave you in the first place. That's a spiritual experience. If you go and have a relationship with this person, I'm telling you in advance, it will kill you slowly but surely. And you know what? You'll have fun in the beginning. And it may feel good in the beginning, but that's how he works. He just lures you in. And before you know it, your life is ruined, you die, and you go to hell. There are some really, really nice, successful people who are going to go to hell. Because being nice and successful are not the prerequisites of satisfying this person. See, the Bible says that you're a sinner. You were born a sinner, night of the living dead. Your relationship with here is broken by nature. And unless you establish that relationship, you're not a child of God. You're a child of your, of your parents. The Bible says you were born a child of wrath. And until you establish this relationship, you're not a child of God. Don't think you're a child of God because you were born in the U.S. of A. You got an American flag out in your head, house and you haven't been arrested. That's not a prerequisite. Matter of fact, uh, 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 um, number four in your notes, spiritual life comes from the Spirit of God. Turn to John chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the fourth book of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 3. Everyone say Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a rabbi. He was a Pharisee. Pharisees were the religious 
separated ones. They had just special robes. They had these leather straps that went around their head with little leather boxes. In the leather boxes, they had the Bible verses. They had them on their wrists. They had the Word of God in their mind, the Word of God in their hands. Unfortunately, they didn't know it was supposed to be in their heart. And he watched Jesus do all this stuff. How many of y'all know somebody, and you, when you watch their life and you hear about what happens in their life, you say to yourself, how does that happen? It's like their life is unexplainable. They have this supernatural stuff happens to them. Anybody? You know anybody like that? Just one person. At least you know someone like that. How many of you do not know someone like that? Okay. Some of y'all don't want to vote. That's okay. <laughs> That's what Nicodemus said to Jesus. He said, Jesus, you're doing all this stuff. You're walking on water. You're healing dead people. You're, 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 you're healing the blind, the mute, the, 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 the raising, the, the casting out demons. You're speaking to the weather. Come on, brother. How do you do that? That's what he said. Look at verse 1. It says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. Everyone say, Nicodemus. A ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night because he didn't want to come in day and be seen. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do the signs you do unless God is with him. Basically, you are the bomb. Can you explain your bombness? <laughs> Jesus said, truly, truly, verily, verily, show enough, show enough, I say to you. <laughs> unless one is born again, say born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He said, Nicodemus, because you are physically born once, your spirit is dead. Remember, you're a sinner. So you have to be born now of the spirit and establish afresh a relationship with your heavenly father. Spiritually. It's not a religion. It's not rules in your head. It's a spiritual relationship with this person. Because now you have a relationship with this person by nature. Verse 4. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can you imagine getting saved at church and going, Mom, I got some good news and I got some bad news? <laughs> That's a sure way of seeing God real quick because she will kill you right there on the spot. <laughs> we are not going down that road again. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, Show sure enough, show sure enough, I say to you, unless one is born of water, say water, and the Spirit, say Spirit. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Your first, your first, Birth is of flesh. I'm not a woman, but the womb is about right here. Your first birth is from the womb. A woman is a wombed man, a wombed human. Womb and everything that comes with the womb and everything that comes to support what that womb is going to produce, which is the baby. Okay? That's associated with the womb. It is, to protect the baby. Okay? Okay? Ladies, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. See, you fell, yeah. ladies know what I'm talking about. And, but that's the first birth. The problem is that the woman and the man are sinners, and they're going to die, so they're going to produce a person that's going to die. Jesus says, if you're born again of the Spirit of God, and you have spiritual life, not physical only, spiritual, then you'll live forever. Look what it says. That, verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born in the Spirit. Why? Because when you ask Christ to be your Savior and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you and establishes a relationship in your heart, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, to you, about your life according to God's heart for your life. It's a relationship. It's not a religion. It's a spiritual relationship. It's not a religion. It's not rules. It's a relationship. And by the way, when we say rules, does the Bible have rules? It has guidelines. Yes. Every relationship has guidelines. How many of you are all dating somebody or you're married? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, I would hope that all those relationships are based on love. Amen? Amen. You hope. Now, but even though, even though you have a love in your relationship, there's still rules. Aren't there? Girls, are there rules? Oh, Yes. That, you better not talk to that skis if she calls again. <laughs> That's a rule. Can I get an amen from the ladies in the house? Yeah. There's rules. Okay. We all got rules. So even though there's love, there's rules. And if you break the rule, and by the way, and the girls, are, girls are, are, are famous for this. We're supposed to know the rules without them being spoken. <laughs> Fellas, don't that drive you crazy? You're just supposed to know. And if you break the rule, <laughs> but if you obey the rules, 
Can I get an amen for the fellas? Okay, so, dang. <laughs> so, <laughs> and by the way, if you break the rule, you send a message that you don't honor the love. It's not about the rule. It's about what breaking the rule means about the love. Same thing with God. God doesn't want you following rules. He wants you to follow. He wants you to love him. He wants you to love him. He wants to love you. It's a relationship. Where do you think that whole concept comes from? God. So how could you have any relationship with anybody, especially call love and not acknowledge God? Because he's the one who created that. And your relationship with somebody else and your love with someone else is a metaphor, a word picture for what God wants to have with you. That's the whole point. The devil wants you to think it has nothing to do with it. He's so good at thinking, making you believe that. So obvious fact. Jesus said, if you're born again and you accept that you're a sinner, that you're going to die, you accept that your sin has separated you from your God relationship, and you accept that Jesus Christ died in your place, that your sin may be forgiven so you can establish a relationship with God, a spiritual one. If you understand that and you ask him to forgive you, he will establish that relationship so quickly and immediately. Why? Because that is the reason he created you, to have a relationship with you, to love you. And then the Spirit can speak to you about the deep things that God has for you and start to bless you and love you so much beyond what you can imagine. That is the spiritual experience you need to be seeking. And by the way, that is the purpose of life. Because in the end, you're going to die. and He ain't going to care about your money, your degrees, your accomplishments. It means nothing. He's going to care about were you faithful to my friend, your friend, this person, or did you follow this guy? By the way, this guy's name, liar, murderer, deceiver, destroyer, accuser. There's nothing good about this dude. It's like if you ladies met someone in the store trying to take you out and you ask him his name and he said, my name is Player. <laughs> Please. And if you go out with him, you deserve getting your heart broke. You deserve it. Well, he said his name was Player, but he was just so cute and I went out with him anyway. Okay, well, you're stupid. <laughs> I, know he, I know he had five girlfriends, but he broke up with them and they were all psycho anyway, so I didn't really hold that against him. Like I said, you're stupid. So if you, if you know the devil has lied, cheated, steal, destroyed so many people's lives and you have a relationship with him anyway, you're stupid. It's dumb. And by the way, you may say, well, I don't have a relationship with the devil, but I don't have a relationship with God anyway. That's a classic example of having a relationship with the devil and not knowing it. Why? Because you are an eternal person. And either you're alive with a relationship with God and this person, or you're dead. And you have a relationship with this person, one or the other. And either you're going to spend eternity in heaven, or you're going to spend eternity in hell. Check out the evidence. People die. Check out the evidence. Sin has consequences. Check out the evidence. Christians who really trust God's lives change for eternity. And by the way, can you change your life thinking positively? Yes, but you still go to hell. I changed my marriage thinking positive, positive thoughts. Very good. That works sometimes for changing marriages, but it doesn't change your soul and it doesn't get you to heaven. So you can change your life by thinking positive and working hard and having a plan and get money and have a good family and still go to hell. You don't want that. You want to do both. You want to say, Lord, you tell, I want to have a relationship with you. And then God will say, here's how you think positively. Yes, but here's how you can listen to my voice and think wisely and have spiritual life. So in a minute, we're going to pray. My challenge to you is that if you want to establish a relationship with God and have your sin forgiven, a relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's very simple. You simply acknowledge that you're a sinner, that sin has separated you from God. You acknowledge that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead for your sin. And you ask him to forgive you. You say, I'm sorry. I want to have a relationship with you. I want the Holy Spirit, the good spirit, to live in me. Speak to me. Guide me. Direct me. Convict me of when I'm wrong. Encourage me. Shape my heart. Show me the deep things that God has for me. I want that. If you ask him, as we will in a minute, he will give it to you. And then it's a relationship, not a religion. Say relationship. You walk with him every day just like you would a friend, and you talk to him, and he talks to you. 
You cast your cares on him, he cares for you, and he encourages you back. He tells you secrets about your life. He laughs with you, he cries with you when you're down, he encourages you. He's there every day. Now, if you say no, then just so you know, what you're saying is I want to have a relationship with this person. You can't be neutral because you're eternal. And where you end up in the end, heaven or hell, determines who your relationship with is with now. So either you choose God or you choose the devil, hell. And the devil would love to have you blinded to think there's no devil. Just read the Bible about what describes him and you'll see you, you interact with him every day. Every time, you, every time you watch TV, the devil speaks to you. You watch Desperate Housewives, some of you housewives, it will convince you that you're desperate. You listen to music, it convince you to act that way. He just subtly poisons you. Do it yourself. Do it your way. Don't listen to God. Constantly, constantly, constantly. There's no consequences. Just look around you. Look at the consequences. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Listen very carefully. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for loving us. Holy Spirit, we want to acknowledge that you are real. We want to acknowledge that you understand us, that you could speak to us, that we could speak to you, that you can love us, we can love you, that you comfort us, you encourage us, you guide us, you empower us, you equip us. We want to acknowledge that you are a person. You're not a thing. You're not a light. You are a person that lives inside of us and speaks to us and changes our heart, our desires, our thoughts. And so we want to acknowledge today that Jesus died for our sin and rose from the dead, and that if we confess that he did that for us and we surrender our life to him, the Holy Spirit will live inside of our heart, will forgive us of our sin, grant us eternal life, establish a relationship with us. If you would like to establish that relationship or renew that relationship, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I know I'm a sinner, and I believe my sin is wrong, and I believe I'm going to die, and I believe I am eternal. I'm going to live forever somewhere in heaven or hell. I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want to live in hell now. I believe Jesus died and rose from the dead for my sin. Jesus, please forgive me. I want to be born all over again. Born of the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, please come live inside of my heart. Establish a relationship with me. Speak to me. Cleanse me of my sin. Seal me. Seal my salvation. Holy Spirit, I surrender my life to you. Thank you for being patient. Thank you, God, for forgiving me. Thank you, God, for accepting me. As all of our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, in a minute I'm going to ask you to stand up. But if you prayed, what you told God is, God, I just established a relationship with you. And I know it is eternal. I know it's forever. I know it's spiritual. And I thank you for forgiving me. And I'm surrendering my life to you. So when I ask you to stand, you shouldn't have to worry about what anybody in here is thinking. This is between you and God. Because when you die, you will stand before God alone. Married or single, doesn't matter. You will stand before God alone and give account for your life alone. You will give account for this moment alone. So eyes closed, heads bowed. If you're saying, yes, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me. I want to ask you right now to stand to your feet. Eyes closed, heads bowed. Just stand to your feet. If you pray that, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Stay standing good. God bless you. 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 Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. God bless you. God is whispering to you and he's saying, 
What are you waiting for? <laughs> He's saying, what are you going to do without me? Where are you going to go? Who are you going to trust in? Anybody else? Many of you are standing. Don't walk out of here being in doubt. God bless you. 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 We see you all over the room. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. There are many, many of you. You're not alone. Anybody else? God bless you. Jesus. Anybody else? You know, the Holy Spirit whispers to you and he tells you great and mighty things you don't know. Sounds like your conscience, but it's always biblical. It's God. It's not you. And he's telling you right now, some of you, come on. Straighten your legs and your body will rise. Your heart is pounding right now because your heart is saying, why are you waiting? This is what I need, please. Anybody else, stand to your feet. God bless you. God bless you. Good. God bless you. Good. Now we're going to ask all y'all who are standing to do one more thing. In a minute, we're going to ask you to come down to the altar. If you're in the balcony, all you have to do is turn around and walk up, and the ushers will tell you what to do. So as we welcome these people into the family of God, we're going to ask you to step out of your seat and come on down to the altar. Let's get them a hand in hand. Say, Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Stay right there. How you doing? Amen. Hey, girl. Amen. Say, Jesus. God bless you. 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 Amen. 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 Oh, sorry. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Say Jesus. God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. Amen. Come on, let's keep cheering for him. Let's keep cheering for him. God bless you. 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 Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Say Jesus. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. 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 I want you to imagine if, if there was somebody you knew that knew everything about every single one of you, even all your junk and all your secrets, and he loved you anyway. As a matter of fact, every, he knew everything about you and how much you hated him, and yet he loved you anyway. That's God. Everything you've ever done. And everything you've ever done to try to get satisfied another way broke his heart because it violated the love, and yet he loves you anyway. And he didn't kill you when you walked down there. He didn't say, now nah, I got you. Because you didn't have to do this for him to get you. He could have got you a long time ago. The only reason he didn't get you because he's been waiting so he can love you. That's the truth. Amen? And yet we always try to go somewhere else. The Bible says we go whoring after another God. We have a relationship with God. The church is the bride. He's the groom. We're married to him. That's why the marriage and the symbol of marriage is so sacred to God. It's a relationship. And we go looking for what we can get from God. When we go looking for it somewhere else, the Bible calls it whoring after another God. Be, being an adulteress. That's what the Bible calls it. It's all in the Bible. And so what, the relationships we have here is just a metaphor for this relationship. This is the supreme relationship. That's the model. And so 
Every single one of you, he loves you so much and he wants to have a relationship with you, not a religion. He doesn't want you to, have, he doesn't want you to be obligated to the Rock Church for anything. He wants you to be obligated to him, to love him. And if he tells you to come to church here, you do it because he told you. If he tells you to go somewhere else, you go there and you be happy. <laughs> if he tells you to read the Bible, which he will, you read the Bible. If he tells you to get rid of your friends, you get rid of your friends. Trust him because he knows your friends better than you. And you know your friends are no good. <laughs> Amen? Some of them anyway. Some of them anyway, right? And so the quicker you do what he says, the quicker you be blessed. Why? Because he knows the deep things of God as it pertain to you. He knows those things. And so you just have to trust him. It is a walk of faith. And by the way, the longer you walk with God, the more faith you're going to need. I have to use faith every day. I have to use more faith today than I ever had in my life. So that's the foundation of your relationship with him. Why? Because he's always going to tell you and, and, and ask you to do things into more unknownness. He's going to say, I want you to do this. You're not going to know all the facts. He says, I'm not going to tell you because I want you to trust me. It's all about trust. Because if you trust me, then I can do more than you can ask or imagine. But if you have to know all the information, we can't work that way. He doesn't want to have that relationship with you. It's a relationship of trust. And so just know that. And the number one thing you can do, the only thing you have to do, and this is the definition of loving God, and it is the only thing you have to do for the rest of your life, is to love him, which means to obey him. Do what he says. It is that simple. You do what he says. And the only way you can do what he says is if you, do, if you read the book, because why? Reading the book is doing what he says. And in here you learn more about what that means. You do what he says. And if, if you get yourself in trouble, all you have to do is ask, did I do what God says? And the answer will be no. That's it. But if you do what he says, oh, by the way, if you do what he says and people hate you, that's not trouble. That's not trouble. It's, there will be uh, uh, people who will leave you, people who criticize you and persecute you. But the Bible says they're persecuted for his name's sake. But that's not trouble. Trouble was, I mean, that you, 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 uh, you violated a law <laughs> or you did something wrong. But following God, yeah, people are going to respect you and people are going to criticize you. That's not what I'm talking about trouble, though. That's, just, that's, just, that's what they did to Jesus. They killed him. Okay? But you know when he killed him, that wasn't trouble. He was fulfilling his mission. Guess what he is today? He's alive. So this pain on earth is very temporary. Matter of fact, the consequences of pain are very overrated. Pain is, it has a purpose. It's not going to kill you. And so I want to encourage all of you, talk to the Holy Spirit like your friend. Say to him, Holy Spirit, how are you doing today? Can you speak to me? Can you guide me and direct me? What do you got for me today? Every single day. Why? Because you got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're all one, and the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. He's the one that was commissioned to live in your heart and speak to you and to teach you what this says, to guide and direct you. And when you're doing something wrong, you're going to go, I don't, I don't feel right. That's the Holy Spirit. You're grieving him. He's going, don't do that. Before you do it, and you know it, you're like, you're doing it, and you know it's wrong, right? See all these sinners out here? They know it's wrong. <laughs> but, but we do. We, do we, we, we just know it's wrong, and it's like, eh, we do it anyway. And as soon as we do it, God goes, oh. And then we go, oh. He goes, okay, I love you. Let's try it again. And then next time you do it, you're like, eh, And you're like, I'm not going to do it this time. And you're like, eh, you're prying yourself away from me because you want to do it. And then after you, <sighs> When I stopped doing cocaine, I went to a nightclub. I stopped doing cocaine in one day, and I went to the nightclub. After I stopped doing cocaine, I got saved, and a friend of mine was offering me the cocaine. And I didn't get high with him. We were not friends. We weren't buddies. We really, I didn't really like him. And he, I don't think he liked me. It was just, we weren't friends. But he kept offering me this cocaine. I'm like, why is he offering me cocaine? I'm not his friend. So I walked away. And it felt so good. It was like God was saying, good job. So he followed me. He said, come on, man, let's go get high. I was like, no, 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 I don't do that anymore. No walked away. I was like, man, that felt good. I said, you know, it felt so good. I started to follow him to walk next to him just so he would ask me, just so I could say no. <laughs> now, please do not do that. Do not do that. <laughs> I did that. And then that night, I walked out the club. How many of y'all remember the Oz? <laughs> it was in the Oz. <laughs> I walked out, and I remember walking out and going, I'm done. My point is, is that when you obey, God's, yes. If you just do that every single day, oh, your life will be unexplainable. You were sitting there going, how'd that happen? How'd that happen? How'd that happen? I say that all the time. How'd that happen? Still, I, I need that <laughs> more than ever. 
So it's by faith, by obeying. We're going to pray for y'all, and then we're going to ask all y'all to walk up this aisle. We're, can we get we're the, right to that guy right there, straight up the aisle, and we're going to take you in the room and talk to you about what you did. If these are your family and friends, are going to be in that room back there. So let's pray for them right now. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. We thank you so much for these people. We thank you for being good to us. And Lord, I thank you for your presence. Thank you for loving us and knowing us and speaking to us. And I pray you continue to speak to all of us, that our relationship with you become more and more real, more and more tangible, more and more relevant to our life. There wouldn't be some rules in a book. It would be a relationship. And I pray these people's lives would never change. They would speak to you tonight when they go to bed. They would acknowledge your presence. They would speak to you when they're driving home. And they would know that you know things about them that they need to know. And they wouldn't try to go find those things anywhere else but you. Thank you for being so good to us. In Jesus' name, amen. As you leave, if you want to give to the crusade, please do that. But let's give these people a hand as they walk out, walk this way. Say, Jesus!